Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the BPCA webinar. My name is Natalie Bungay, and today we're going to be talking about practical wasp management. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started, just so you know what to expect. First thing first, I can't see you or hear you. So if you have any questions, hopefully you'll be able to see you've got an option to type a question. Um, that will then pop up on my screen here. Now, please, when you're ready to, whether it be now or during the presentation, make sure you get those questions typed out, because what I'll do is halfway through, and then also at the end, we'll have a brief little pause so that I can address those questions, and hopefully um, there'll be, be a few of them. Um, just a few other bits as well. Um, if you do ask a question, just make sure you answer it once. Uh, sorry, ask it once. If it is a question that um, for some reason we can't get an answer to today, then um, I'll, I'll leave it on my screen at the end of the presentation. I'll make sure that, that we address it afterwards and get in touch with you directly. Um, anything, uh, so feedback afterwards as well. We'd love some feedback after the webinar. Let us know what you thought of it and also any recommendations of, of topics you'd like to cover later on in the year. Um, CPD as well. We've got some CPD points for today. Um, everybody who's registered, you would have uploaded your uh, uh, CPD information and your points will be automatically allocated. This presentation is also available afterwards. You can go on the website. It's on YouTube and um, view it. However, to gain CPD points um, for it after this live session, you will most likely have to log those points yourself. But we can go through that um, if you do decide to do that or any of your colleagues. Um, so, yes, just um, get us going then. Uh, as I said, remember, questions, if you have them, please do make sure you get them on the screen for me. OK, fabulous. So practical wasp management. I've got a few um, goals that I would like to achieve today. We're going to talk a little bit about biology and the pests themselves and um, just refresh ourselves with it. But I think what most of you with us today would like to see or here is really the practical implementation dealing with wasp nests because we do get quite a lot of questions around products, their labels, um, safety and what you should and shouldn't do. So um, hopefully we can, you know, if you've got some good questions coming through, I will cover that as well. But I would like you to um, extend the session by asking questions that I might not cover here today. Um, we're expecting sort of 30 minutes to 60 minutes is normally what we have. So, again, you um, I rely on you to. Um, ask these questions and um, yeah, get some get some good good talk going. Okay, so these are the, these are topics we'll cover, um, and we further ado, we will move on. So a bit about biology. I think it's really important for you to know the life cycle and a bit of biology about wasps because, and in my own experience, certainly your customers appreciate your knowledge. And when you are called to a job and they want to talk about why these wasps are here and what times of year they build their nest, it's really important that you can show that knowledge and that confidence. Um, your, your customers always want to see that. So just to address that a little bit, just a bit of a refresh for everybody. So the, it really starts with the queen, as we all know, who will come out of um, hibernation, but overwintering is another name we use for that. Um, she will come out all different times of year, it may be any time between April and May when the weather is warming, she will then awaken, um, leave her nest and see here. She'll normally start building a, a nest. We get to about a golf ball size. We're all familiar with that size that we'll find in um, uh, an outside shed or a corner of an attic where she's just started building those first cells. Um, the queen will normally lay about 10 to 20 eggs initially. So she wants to look after those 10 to 20 eggs, which hatch out into larvae. She'll go off and start feeding them various things, normally catching aphids and insects in flight, cutting the wings off and taking it back to the larvae to, to feed her new brood. So once all that hard work is done um, and those workers have hatched out into adults, they've pupated. So it's a, um, a complete life cycle. So they do need to pupate as well. Once they've hatched out, normally take about six weeks, you're looking. So from when the queen starts building her nest to when the workers hatch out we're looking at about five to six weeks um, and then um, yeah once that's happened the workers will take over and the queen can then um, spend all of her time producing new eggs so we're looking at about two to three hundred eggs per day and you might say to yourself 
colonies normally get to about 5,000 is, is, a, is a good marker of the size of wasp nests normally at their peak. So, you know, two to 300 eggs a day, that maybe would suggest there would be more than that. However, workers don't actually live for very long. Um, usually a couple of weeks. So, you know, obviously she needs to refresh these workers all the time to make sure that they're able to look after the nest and do what they need to do. So as this goes on, the expansion will slow down slightly and the population growth rate will slow um, and then eventually it will stop. Um, the queen will decide that, yeah, it's coming to the close of a season. She'll start laying queen eggs um, and also drones, so male um, uh, male male eggs as well. Who, at the end of of that cycle, the workers will leave because they don't really have a nest or a queen to particularly protect now. So she will leave. Th those workers would generally become a bit more foraging. This is when we find that in autumn we have a lot more problems around picnic areas when we're eating outside, and um, those those worker wasps who haven't got too much to do with themselves are looking for sweet, lovely. Um, substances to um, uh, to feed on, and that's when we do tend to have a lot more problems with them. Um, so yeah, in this decline, as I said the queen will normally die, and you know, from getting sick, the new queens will be fertilised by the males, and then the cycle pretty much starts again. So those queens will look for a hibernation spot, and the cycle will start again. So that's really good when you're speaking to your customers. I think having that that knowledge of the cycle um, is really handy because it, it gives them some real insight into, you know, not only your knowledge, but maybe what to expect next year. Um, and if we do get to the point where those new virgin queens um, have been fertilised and hibernated, the following year may, may obviously have a few more nests around in that area. Okay, so um, I've already possibly mentioned a few of these points, but again, just with biology and behaviour, these, these few bullet points are, are great pieces of information to, to retain and, and have with you um, day to day when you're out there dealing with wasp nests. So there are social insects, similar to, to ants, are very closely related. And it, it, it is what it says, a social insect. They normally live in large colonies within nests together and they work together. So they're a, a social insect. Um, we've seen them in various areas that they'll build a nest in soils and banks, roof spaces, cavities in trees, etc. So anywhere that that queen, when she initially comes out at the beginning of spring, will decide that it's suitable for her nest that she wants to build. As I said, they can get to 5,000. I'm sure some people on here have maybe seen larger nests where they think maybe a few more than that. But generally, um, about 5,000 workers is, is what we can expect. Um, as we know, they can sting multiple times. Um, I was actually reading them, there's a story not too long ago in our, our last magazine <clears throat> in May where unfortunately a pest controller did actually die from just two stings. Um, it caused an anaphylactic shock and unfortunately he couldn't get help in time and did succumb to it. So, um, you know, just one wasp can sting you multiple times and that's why, you know, we need to take big measures on keeping ourselves safe. But I'll talk a bit more about safety later on. Um, so colonies will only survive for one season, unlike honeybees, um, who can obviously sustain themselves. And that's because of the honey that they have. They've got their food source there. They keep themselves warm enough and they can sustain themselves. Whereas wasps, they rely on aphids to feed on um, some nectar from plants and flowers. So obviously during the colder temperatures and winter, we don't have that food source for them. So they can't survive through the winter time. And they won't use old nests. We might feel that sometimes they, they nest close by or they might even attach onto an old nest, but they, they, they will not use um, an old nest. Um, they can also pollinate as well. So, um, you know, we all, we all say oh, yes, they can pollinate and I'm, I'm not sure how many of you understand how they do that. Um, but as you can see from this photo here, um, they actually do have hairs on their body. We, we kind of assume maybe wasps are very, so much different from bees that the, the hair that covers their body is so minimal that they can't pick up the pollen buds to transfer them from flower to flower. So therefore they don't pollinate. But as you can see, they do have these hairs. So when the wasps are feeding on the nectar, of which they particularly like, they will pollinate. So, you know, they are beneficial. Um, and as um, I mentioned earlier, they do need to feed or they do feed the larvae on insects and aphids. So certainly gardens, people keen gardeners, it can help with um, aphid control. So they, they do have a real important um, part of the ecosystem. So it's really, really good to remember that as much as 
you know, um, what is part of our um, work that we do, and they can cause some, you know, serious health issues. They they do have some some good benefits as well. So again, another a few little bits here. So I mentioned a few. I tend to get carried away. So I mentioned a, a bit of this at the beginning, but just to refresh again, I think it's always good to do that. So 10 to 20 eggs laid per day in the beginning for the queen. That's what she does to get her workers up and ready and um, can leave her to egg laying. Um, the larvae feed on chewed insects. Um, they develop in about four weeks. And as I mentioned, they are a complete life cycle. So they've got their egg, larvae, pupae, and then adult. Um, we can normally distinguish the wasps from the, you know, they're more usually stronger in yellow color. They do have the black stripes as well. But again, this photograph, you can see there that, um, you know, the yellow color is very strong. Um, adults, the length of them, the lifespan, um, it's only a few weeks. Again, I mentioned before, so this constant egg laying and production of workers is really important for the queen to keep those numbers stable and strong so that the nest can um, become successful. So they don't live very long at all. Um, and we all know we all know when a wasp is harmed and crushed, it can emit a series of distress chemicals. So, um, you know, we recommend you not to not to stamp on them or sort them away. But I think that is a natural reaction and behavior. And we can't expect anyone to do that. But it does emit a series of these distress chemicals um, a bit later on. There's quite a, just for interest. There's a bit of a graph uh, or diagram I've got of the different um, toxic elements to a wasp sting. Um, and then one of them particularly mentions this distress chemical. So, um, yeah, that's just for a bit of interest later. OK, so, um, you know, I don't, you know, these, as I said, this introduction of biology and a bit about wasps, it really is just a refresh for you. I think later on the safety talks that we're going to do and, and treatment talks are going to be really useful. But I think here just to um, touch on the signs of infestations and when to act. So um, seeing a nest, you know, your customers might ask you these questions as well. Um, obviously, you see a nest like these, these images here. You can see one in the corner causing a health and safety problem, maybe needs dealing with. Also seeing the workers, um, the distinctive flight path to the nest. You know, we've all certainly I used to get a bit of a, a bad neck in the summer times from looking up at the sky most of the time, looking for that flight path from um, the wasps feeding fields back to the nest again. And once you've got to catch sight of it, you can sometimes then follow it back to where the nest might be. It's not always that way, um, but it can help. Um, I always certainly found that um, you know, because you get called to a wasp nest, sometimes it will turn out to be bees. And, you know, if you're not too distant from where the nest entrance is, I always found that wasps would have this more direct flight path with a few workers hovering on the outside. But generally, it was quite direct. They knew where they were going. Whereas bees, uh, honeybees, they, they tend to swarm a little bit more around the entrance. They tend to hang around. And I think that's the defence. It's the, um, the workers defending the colony. Um, slightly different behaviour there. Um, and, and just from that um, flight behavior can sometimes distinguish whether it's bees or, or wasps. So it is important to know these things so that you can identify them. Binoculars always helps as well, I find. Um, so yeah, a few bits about the signs. Um, just before some questions, we'll do some um, questions on the next slide. Um, but just to get us warmed up for what will be coming on later is, is really, do we need to treat all nests? Like I mentioned before, they are beneficial, they pollinate and they have aphid control and they are part of our ecosystem. So we need to really think about, you know, do we need to treat every nest that we come across? Can they be left alone? Um, and it is important to ask yourself. So this will probably form most of the legal requirement in terms of, you know, health and safety legislation and also really um, product uh, label conditions. So, you know, ask yourself, you know, do, is, is this nest a health and safety risk? Is it in a position that could cause harm? Is there anybody in the area that, uh, within the close vicinity, that has a possible reaction to wasp stings or maybe particularly um, um, sensitive to having a wasp sting? And if you feel that there is, and that can be justification. Um, so just to remember that, you know, stings carry these toxins that we react to, um, they can complete a contamination risk as well, because wasps will land on some unsavory um, areas. And if they then land on your plate or your food, they can contaminate that through physical means. Um, but also wasps don't generally cause damage. Uh, customers do ask that sometimes. They feel maybe wasps will, will cause damage. 
Um, but yes, of all these all these things we need to think about. And if we feel that, yes, we do have this justification, then we're, we're good to go ahead. OK, so a few questions. I've got a couple on my screen right now. So um, why are there often multiple golf ball size nests abandoned? Oh, blimey, Simon, that could be um, many reasons. It might be the food source in that area has not been able to sustain the queen. Um, the queen might have just succumb in the field you know might one of us might have stamped on her or um a, a predator of some other description might have got her but it will be because the queen has succumbed in some way um or another but yes we, yeah we do find that sometimes don't we um hopefully that's that's answered your um question with that um we are it's another question here so is there any evidence that wasps would be drawn to a previous season nest to utilize the nest material no i mean there's not um it's always been a, i say a debate for a long time not really but the opinion is always that wasps will not use an old nest and i i haven't known of them utilizing anything within that nest that would benefit them in a new season and the reason being is they they don't really store anything that would benefit a new nest you know they don't store food um, you know the larvae that might have um, remained in the nest that, that didn't quite pupate and has gone rotten and horrible you know none of these things are going to really be beneficial for um, for a wasp the materials that they use and also um, I didn't mention early on in terms of the cycle is that um, you know the queen how she starts to build her nest and then the workers following is by chewing up materials you know bark and woods to get a paper form paste and she starts building it and that's what they do they don't generally take materials from a previous nest and then uh, utilize it might make it easier for them i guess wouldn't it but um so no that isn't something that there were any evidence of that happening um one more question um so what do cause damage uh with eating plaster and wall cavities yeah i mean lance i think again if you've come across that and it is something that um when I say damage, I mean, maybe substantial. Um, it'd be interesting to know if you have any pictures of that as well, whether or not, um, yeah, that's something we could see. That would that would be great. But yeah, it's not a, I say it's not a common um, a conception that wasps will cause damage. But Lance, if you've seen that, um, great. As we know with pests, they always surprise us, don't they? Um, so, OK, I think that's the, got another question set um, towards the end of this presentation. So. Um, actually, I've got two more pop up. Let's do another couple of, of questions. So is there any reason why wasps tend to revisit the same houses every other year? We have customers who get a wasp nest every other year, but next to an old one. Karen, it will simply be, um, like I mentioned, with the uh, new queens that will hatch out, fertilise and then hibernate or overwinter. If they happen to have overwintered in a area close to um, this this neighbor's property then and they happen to find another nesting site they will nest there um there would be no particular reason other than the queens are obviously surviving quite well in hibernation um exiting their overwintering spot and finding that your customer has a nice um comfy voided uh, property where these these wasps can, these queens can get in there and build a nest that would be simply it's an attractive site to them um, I'll do one more question and then we will do uh, the rest towards the end. So can amateur products be used by professionals to treat nests? Pyrethrin spray products from hardware shops, for example. Um, so yes, in short, there's no issue legally with you using them. However, the professional use products are there for a reason, obviously. The other way around, absolutely you can't. Um, amateurs cannot use professional use products. Um, but yes, I mean, there are some amateur use products, as you know, that you can buy from your suppliers and then sometimes you can pass on to them. Um, I know some companies do uh, carry out those, those uh, processes, but yes, you can. You can use amateur use products. Um, uh, for pest control not necessarily beneficial right i've got two more questions come through but i'm just going to move on with the presentation and then at the end i can then get through any more questions so there's an anonymous one and also one from james that i promised you i will get to you um, we'll just we'll do that just towards the end okay so um but about safety i actually done a risk assessment uh, webinar a 
fair few weeks ago, which again is available on YouTube and our website. So the bits we're going to talk about now, um, we're going to talk about risk assessments and safety procedures. If you want to know a bit more about risk assessments and safety procedures specifically, then the webinar we've done a few weeks ago would be really helpful for you to um, structure WASP control around. Um, but yeah, so the things we need to think about. So obviously technician safety, your customer safety, post-treatment and non-target species. So these are all the elements. If you're going to be doing a risk assessment, these are the bits you need to cover. So technician, I'm, I'm really, you know, today I can't talk about you in risk assessments in too much detail, but I think what I wanted to do here is to give you a few bullet points of the, the areas to cover when you're, the, the things to think about when you're doing a risk assessment. Now, whether you're a sole trader or if you've got a team of technicians, this will be useful for you all. Um, but so technician wise, training and knowledge. They will be two of the most important things because without training and without knowledge, there's a lot of risks involved. Um, obviously, with stings, that's going to be the main issue. But, you know, knowing the behavior of them, knowing what they need to do to keep themselves safe and the use of the products and the safety use of the products. So training and knowledge, all these things you need to make sure are put in place. Um, and it's part of your risk assessment because part of your risk assessment is the way you've reduced a risk is by giving your technician training and knowledge. Um, also PPE, um, you'll generally always need PPE when dealing with wasp nests. It's normally a, a last resort, we say, in the hierarchy of controls. But you know, when you're dealing with a wasp nest, be it small or large, early in the season or late in the season, wearing a veil and protecting yourself is so very important. As I mentioned earlier with um, that unfortunate death of a pest controller with just two stings. That's, that's all it can take. One sting is all it can take. Um, so really important we wear these uh, protective equipment. Too often have I seen, you know, um, individuals feeling that, you know, they're experienced enough and um, tough enough not to, not to wear them. But um, it is certainly very important. Um, so, yeah, method statements. Uh, again, these documents, we have we have them all, um, templates, et cetera, but a method statement for your technician or for you that you can show your customer on the processes that you take through dealing with wasp nests and the precautions you take. Um, access equipment, so you need to do an assessment on your access equipment if needed any. I know we do have um, application equipment that takes away that height or work in that height element, which is great, which should always be your first your first option or even getting into the attic and dealing with it. But again, that then flags up a lot of our other risks and concerns, isn't it? Confined spaces, normally quite low beams, um, wearing a veil in an in a enclosed environment like that can cause some um, uh, visual issues. You know, you can't see all your surrounds properly. So, um, so access equipment, if you need to get any um, um, cherry pickers or scaffolding or anything like that, so you've, got, you've got to think about it, you've got to be safe. You can't work from, a ladder normally dealing with with wasps so if you put a ladder up against the wall and you go up to treat a wasp nest the legal requirement is that you always have three points of contact both your feet and at least one hand so to deal with a wasp nest with just one hand and safely considering the they sting and you're going to be moving about around a bit on that ladder it's not safe to do so so ladders for me should be um not required unless you're just accessing. So maybe a flat roof or um, an attic space, access only. Um, and a health questionnaire. Um, again, I'm not here to talk about health questionnaires, but a health questionnaire is something that you should do for yourself or your technicians that identifies, is there anything in my career, in my work, that can cause health problems? And if there is, then you develop your own health surveillance, we would call it, or questionnaire. So um, employees, again, if you have a team of technicians or if it's just yourself, have a think about it. You know, have you ever had an allergic reaction to wasp stings? Do you have any allergies generally? Maybe, possibly, you might be more susceptible to having a severe reaction to wasp stings if you do have um, other allergy issues. Um, and also just uh, making sure that, that these questions are asked regularly as well, because things can change. Um, as I said, you know, that case where... Um, someone died from wasp stings, they'd been stung before and nothing had happened. You know, they didn't have a reaction. 
So it wasn't expected. Now that that can, you know, even though we have these health questionnaires, the unexpected can happen, unfortunately. But we must do what we can to try and prevent it and, and ask those questions at the right time. Uh, OK, so customers as well. So you've got to think about them in terms of risk assessment. So their vulnerabilities, you know, have you asked them, do they have any um, um, allergies or any reaction to wasps? That would probably form part of your, you know, do I need to treat this wasp nest? Are their vulnerabilities a concern to the point where we need to rid the property of the nest? Um, you also need to think about, you know, the building and um, the occupant. So are there any children? You know, there might be pets as well. We talked about non-target species. Um, you know, we need to think because we're not just the wasp, but the chemicals that we're using as well. We need to think about um, the building and the occupants. If you're treating a wasp nest that's in or close to a, a ventilation system or just um, uh, some, some bricks in a wall where there's, there's gaps, if you're putting chemical into those areas, then where is it going? So you need to check the other side of, of that property and where your chemical is ending up. Um, so, yeah, and then post treatment. So, you know, when we finish treating the wasp nest, are we confident that, yep, that's completely gone? There's no live wasps around at all. And normally the answer is, well, there might be a few um, few workers hanging around, not sure what they're doing because the nest is gone or depending on what product you use. They, not all of them kill them straight away. It takes a fair few hours. So they're going to be pretty upset. Um, and during your treatment as well, they're going to be pretty upset. So you're protected. What about... Um, you know, uh, barriers and, and things like that that you might need to create to protect everybody else. And after the treatments, as I said, it could be a fair few hours afterwards that they're active. So think about, you know, barriers and signs and advice and always write it down in your, your treatment reports. Um, and your clean up and advice. Um, talk a bit about labels in a bit. Um, I had a, a few questions earlier this week, which um, has sort of added to this presentation, which is great. Um, but yeah, certainly clean up of any any chemicals that that might be around that you can get access to. Um, but yeah, in, in the red box there, conceivably the most dangerous situation is to accidentally disturb a nest while in an enclosed space. Certainly done it before myself, gone into an attic to look for a nest that's in the corner of the roof. Actually, there was one I didn't realise would be there just above the, the, the hatch of the attic. And yes, that um, attic hatch went through that nest and there were, yeah, was a problem. So we need to think of these sorts of, uh, of potentials as well and make sure you're protected at all times, even when you're first going to in inspect the area to find where the nest is, get that PPE on. OK, well, I mentioned earlier, this is just uh, for a bit of information. You can all have a a good look at this. So um, in orange there, you'll see on the left hand side, we've got bee, wasp, hornet and ant venom. And it's just a bit of a, just a, I say a bit of fun, uh, just to see what's um, in an insect's venom, venom. And obviously we're talking about wasp today. So um, you'll see in each circle around all of these chemical components or toxic components, um, you can see the, the wasp um, with the W and the orange marker there. Um, it's within it. And we've got wasp kinin. Um, it forms a large part, apparently, of the venom, but it's yet to be fully characterised. They don't know a lot about it. But we can see on the uh, third row down, um, third one in from the left, histamine. Um, a lot is released in a wasp sting, histamine. That's why we have to take antihistamines to counteract that response when you know stung by, by a wasp. Um, also, there's quite a few on here. Uh, that mention pain. So, um, for instance, serotonin um, acts as an irritant and contributes towards the pain experienced as a result of the venom. And there's quite a few on this chart here that, that mentions pain. So um, that's always a good indication that you've been stung. So, yeah, it's just quite interesting to see all the different um, components of a, of a wasp sting there. OK, so... Um, yeah, we did mention anaphylaxis earlier is a bit of advice here, because I'm sure um, for again, for yourself, um, for any employees or technicians that, that you have is to, as it mentions here, sit down, lie down on the ground, call 999, ask for an ambulance and obviously describe what issue you're having. If you are, do you happen to be with a colleague or somebody else that can do that for you? Obviously, um, that would be would be great. Um, if you do have an adrenaline pen, if it's if um, allergies 
or you know that you have severe reaction to wasp stings and you happen to carry one of these adrenaline pens, then um, you can use that. And no improvement after five minutes, you, um, you use another. But you'll be experiencing the use of that and you'll know yourself how you are supposed to administer that. Um, severity normally increases with, with older age, um, various other issues like heart disease, high blood pressure. Um, there is a very rare underlying condition called mast mastocystosis. Um, and basically, I'm not a, um, a doctor in any shape or form, but it's, it's something called mast cells. They create, create in excessive rates. And apparently with the um, sting, it actually increases the amount of those cells that produced. And these cells actually um, um, uh, uh, make uh, histamine production in massive quantities. So as I mentioned before, histamine is a serious issue and what causes anaphylaxis. So that's what um, these conditions underlie. And also COPD or asthma, they can have, um, if anybody, these, these, these are great questions to I say, ask your uh, customers, you know, you can't delve too much into their medical history or, or current situation, but you need to ask the questions. Do you, you know, is there anything um, you feel you're, um, you have allergies to or have any conditions that you feel might be um, exaggerated by wastings? And, you know, they're, they're important things to ask um, and not just your customers, but your, your employees, technicians and, and think about it for yourself as well. OK, so um, last page before we go on to to the end um, to talk about products and labels. Now, I anticipate there might be a few questions around this. We all know there's been um, a change fairly recently with a favorite product. I'm not here to talk to you about specific trade names or products because it's not something we we generally do we could talk about active ingredients absolutely but we do know there is a uh, bendiacarb uh, a product that used to use quite widely for wasps and uh, external areas and that has now been taken off of the label so you can no longer use that bendiacarb product um, externally um, and again just in anticipation that one of the questions might be to elaborate on that um, I, I did I did check this with um, the manufacturers of this Bendiacarb product and said, well, you know, explain a bit more. And they say, if you you can treat a nest, if, if you are standing outside, but you are treating into a void that's in an internal area, you're fine to do so. However, if you are not confident and you cannot um, be certain that that product is not going to lay external to the building or in an external area then you must choose another product that allows you to use it in external areas so that was the guidance um, there's a variety of pyrethroids as well again you know speak to your suppliers about what's available and then read the label i mean i think that statement always read the label i probably say it 15 times a day um, because that really is all you can do with that product. You know, we, we can talk about, you know, the practical implementation of um, pesticides and the best way to use things. But really, that label is what you have to do and is all you can only do. So if it says that you can't use it in a certain area, you can't use it in a certain area. Um, if uh, a label says you can use it for wasps, great, flying insects. A wasp is a flying insect. So we can use those products as well. Um, formulations are always really um, important to think about, dust, foams, aerosols, liquids, obviously dust forming um, or historically and still probably presently a popular go to formulation. Um, I speak to some people and the benefits they see with the dust, um, you know, again, I can't mention trade names, uh, but, you know, you can pump it into the nest. It gives it time for the workers to move it around and contact the queen, which is the really important bit. So they find that beneficial. Uh, for me personally, if I have a nest that's quite you know, visible and I can see the entrance to it, and I think, yeah, I can get to the middle of that nest with, say, an aerosol, for example, or a foam. That can be a preferential way because you knock them down quickly. And um, not only is that beneficial because you're, you're, you're sorting the issue out quickly, but it's safer for you. The wasps are not necessarily going to be 
on the defensive and off to, to attack you. Um, really important to make sure you do these things first thing in the morning or, or last thing in the evening when all the workers or most of the workers are, are back within the nest. Because again, if you're treating a nest in the middle of the day when there's hundreds, maybe thousands of workers off getting food and you're treating their nest, they're going to be coming back and swarming behind you trying to get back in. So again, that's where 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 you know our PPE is very important if that's the case. So I know the practicability of doing every single nest or call out that you get at you know a, a short period of time in the morning or evenings, but it's always best to try where you can. Absolutely especially as the nests get a lot larger. Okay, so um we'll do a few more questions. I've got about yeah sort of six or seven that have, have popped up here. So um, hi, Natalie. The, the 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 product you were referring to, Bendiacar, I can't mention the trade name, has the following statement on the rear label. Great. So, actions should be taken to prevent foraging bees gaining access to treated nests, preferably by blocking nest entrances, even though bees are no longer on the label. Do bees access wasp nests? Is this typical uh, a typo mistake on the label? So. I'm glad you asked this one. I did have it down to cover anyway. Um, so yes, I've looked at a few products and this Bendiacarb one you mentioned, as well as other um, products have the same statement on there. Now, I've done a bit of research and from my experience, unless there's anyone who in the moment might share it on here, I don't know when a bee would particularly want to access a wasp nest. Bees, they're not vegetarians, but they generally feed on you know, nectar. They produce honey. They, for them to go into a wasp nest that um, has been treated to take something that might be beneficial to them, there's nothing that I can think of that would encourage them to go in. Um, you know, the larvae, they're not going to want to take the larvae out for food. Hornets might. That's another subject altogether. Um, so, yeah, I, I do anonymous. So there's no name there. Um, absolutely. That statement is confusing. And there have been many people who have asked me that same question. And all I can say is that's what it says on the label. Don't focus too much on the bees thing. I know it might be important. Maybe it's something we need to bring up with uh, the manufacturers to ask the question, um, which we'll do. I'll note down here to do that. I'll actually leave your question on there to remind me later. Um, but the important bit, action should be taken to prevent foraging bees gaining access and preferably by blocking entrances. So where you can, you assess the situation. If you can block the entrance or remove the nest, do so. At this point in time, that's what it says on the label. And as I mentioned, you know, what we say or what we think or anybody else uh, doesn't particularly matter at this point in time um, when it's on the label. But if it's something that can be discussed later on to readdress that wording it will be something um, we'll find out. Okay, I'll leave your question up there, as I said, and I'll look into that a bit more for you. Um, how, so from James, how do we treat, treat wasp nests in holes in the ground outside or in soil banks, e.g. garden playgrounds? Uh, we're leaving them in, it, leaving them is not an option where we cannot use Vicam D anymore, to mention the product, and products like another product. Uh, says it is a safety data sheet, avoid release to the environment. Yeah, it, it is tricky. So again, speaking to the supplier, asking about products that, again, I, I don't know all the products that are available there. There's so many being produced and going out and coming in and, and changes. Generally, with label conditions, we'll have a look at them as they come around. But speak to your supplier, ask them about what products you can use in environments such as that, which I do believe there are some that says can be used in and around gardens. Um, now, if they are in soil banks, et cetera, hopefully it'd be easy for you to be able to dig that out as well. So if you're treating, for example, if you use an aerosol, um, you are killing that nest pretty quickly. If you're doing it later in the evening or early in the morning, you've all, most of the wasps are there, you haven't got many to come back. Um, so once you've done that, they'll die relatively quickly and hopefully you can then dig that nest out, which is always gonna be beneficial. That would be my first, um, address. That's the first thing that I would personally try to achieve. And then other than that, going through the labels and finding one that says that I can use it in the areas that you recommend. Um, you've got things like diatomaceous earth, which takes a long time to work or, or a, few, a fair bit longer. That might be an option. 
And certainly if you get a specific scenario that you want to talk to us about and get a bit of a um, feedback or, or soundboard with, with Dee, myself or Kevin, then we're, we're happy to do that. We always like to know the challenges you have out there. But yeah, it needs to say on the label that you can use it in those areas, James. OK, yeah, we've got quite a few questions coming through here. So, um, so Martin, yes, uh, advise members carry an EpiPen. They don't need to be pres prescribed and are only around £10. I carry two in my van. So, yeah, as Martin says, yeah, carry an EpiPen. If it's something that your risk assessment brings up, um, if you've got technicians, you know, if it's for yourself, great. But if it's for um, if you want to supply them to your employees or technicians, it might be a few more questions you might need to ask. Um, uh, I'm not sure around, um, you know, vulnerabilities or um, I, I don't know the specifics about EpiPens. But, yeah, certainly a good point, Martin. Um, you know, they don't cost too much and carry them around just in case. Good uh, recommendation. OK, uh, so Alberto, social wasps and future climate change. The presence of this group of insects can be more dangerous. I'm not sure I have to read that one again. Social wasps and future climate change. The presence of this group of insects can be more dangerous. Sorry, Alberto, I'm not sure what, um, what that question is. I'll come back to it in a minute. Maybe my mind will uh, start working properly again. Um, so, Mike, I've got one from you. So I carry antihistamine in my van in case of being stung. Is there anything else you can recommend to carry? Well, there we go. Martin just said to us, Mike, that, um, yeah, you can get an EpiPen relatively cheaply. So, you know, carrying one of those in your vehicle, if you are happy and assess yourself that that's safe for you to do so and appropriate for you. Um, antihistamines will take quite a while to um, take effect, I believe, um, you know, the, the tablet form, etc. So if you're stung and need something quick, it might not do the job. Um, but yeah, if you have, if you get stung and you just have a, you know, a, a bit of a, an annoying reaction, it's a bit swollen and a bit itchy, but you haven't had a severe reaction, yeah, antihistamines would be be great for that. I certainly carry those around with me. Um, so a new app, what three words, that's the name of the app, um, allow emergency services to track where you are within a three meter square anywhere in the world. Good if you are stung when you're in the middle of nowhere and having a bad reaction. Simon, amazing. We're sharing all sorts of great stuff here today, aren't we? So yeah, there's a new app called What Three Words. That's the name of the app um, Simon recommends. Might be something you can put in your risk assessment as, uh, as extra to do to protect your technicians or yourself. Great, yeah, thanks for that, Simon. I'm going to save your message and I'll have a look at that myself. Um, oh, we've got Martin back here. So I had a call for a nest in a bush over a fish pond. I love a scenario. Um, uh, bush over a fish pond. The nest was physically removed and not treated on site. Two days later, the client ran back to say the nest was being rebuilt. Obviously, with no queen, the workers were simply programmed to rebuild. Again, this small apple size nest removed and opened up to insects. It's an interesting experience. Yeah, I mean, again, debate of what that is. So uh, a worker wasp would not build a new nest unless they had a purpose to, to protect the queen. Um, without a queen, there's going to be no eggs being laid. So what I would imagine it was, Martin, is probably the pheromones that were left behind from that nest attracted, for example, um, a foraging queen that might have come out a bit late of overwintering. And she thought to herself, well, you know, this smells pretty nice. Um, I'm going to make up nest here. So I would put, uh, possibly the, the other scenario of it. But yeah, pretty interesting experience. Um, thanks for sharing that. Um, we've got Russell here. Is permethrin dust as effective as, um, as vendiacarb dust? when used externally for nest entrance, entrances in soil banks, ores, et cetera. Do you use it in the same way around the entrance and taken in by wasps? Well, Russell, read the label. That's all I say. Um, again, my favourite saying. Um, I haven't had any feedback that anyone's had problems with permethrin. Um, I haven't used it myself, haven't been out of using products for a few years. Um, ben Diagar was obviously always the the go-to um, product, but yeah, I mean, there's no no reports that permethrin dust is ineffective or, or not as effective. Just make sure you read the label and you follow it, and it says you can use it for that pest in that situation externally, and what you need to do with it afterwards. Um, again, all of these things. If you want to discuss it more, I think most of you, I recognise your names. You can probably got my phone number, or email, and we can have a chat about it a bit more, and I can ask as I go around seeing 
members doing assessments. I always ask them these questions, how they're getting on with products, how they're working. Um, and, and yeah, that's where we get the feedback. So again, I love that uh, from you guys to let me know. Um, as a beekeeper, I would suggest they do not have any interest in the contents of a wasp nest. There you go. Thanks, Martin. So beekeepers, we discussed earlier that question about um, the label saying about stopping bees from gaining access to that treated wasp nest. They probably wouldn't be interested anyway. So, yeah, we'll have a, we'll have a look at that. Uh, OK, John. Uh, so wasps will visit beehives. Would that be a risk if we are treating wasps with an insecticide powder? I, I wouldn't. It's not a risk that we talk about or consider, John, maybe because it, it's not of high concern or evidential concern. Um, the wasps, yeah, albeit hornets, certainly will, will visit the, the beehives, unless someone wants to correct me here. I don't think wasps would or overly actively seek out um, honeybee nests unless it's particularly accessible and they might want some of the honey, et cetera. But I don't, I don't think it's of much a concern that we really worry about it, that because if we're treating a nest also, that nest is in danger. Those workers are coming back from finding food and concentrating on, you know, trying to recover that nest, um, which hopefully is rarely going to happen. Um, the queen will die and then the wasp will kind of go, oh, I don't know what to do now. And, and off they go. And, and they don't live for very long anyway. So uh, a couple of a week or two. So, no, I, I think that question with, you know, do we need to worry about a treated wasp nest and the wasps? visiting beehives. No, John, I, I, I don't feel that's a concern. Um, so Simon, I am a beekeeper. Bees have no interest at all in wasps or wasp nests. Great. Uh, the only thought I have is that they might use the same entrance at some time after wasps have gone to scout out a location for building their own nest. Yep, could be that. But like you, Simon, and um, a couple of others before have agreed that, yeah, there's bees would have no interest in going into a wasp nest. So I'm glad um, you've helped me out on that one. That's appreciated. And again, something I think maybe we can speak to the manufacturers and, and see and see what they mean by this statement on the label. I think that would be the most useful thing is for me to get some feedback on, on what does this statement mean? Um, hopefully it'd be successful. OK, what are we doing? How are we doing for time? Um, we got a yeah, we've got a little bit of time left for these questions. Um, I can't actually even see the time. There we go. Blimey, we've got yeah, 13 minutes. Time goes flies when you're having fun. So any questions I don't manage to get to, there might be a few because I can see quite a lot popping up. I will promise I'll get back to you all individually um, on, on an email. I know I won't better share it with everybody, but I might not get through all these questions. So um, uh, we've got the what's this? So hi, do you have to use chemicals at all if the nest is removed completely? Well, no, of course not. I know, Alison, that's a hierarchy of, of within cost you know if you can deal with a nest if you feel you can deal with a nest by moving it physically which can happen if you've got a new nest building or forming in a again I use shed for an example because it's just an easy one um, and it's nicely nicely there and you think you can get a bag that's safe and cut it down and pop it in a bag then great yeah don't don't use any chemicals at all Alison if you can do that safely for yourself and everybody else um, OK, Rupert. So, hi, it has been suggested to me that if you remove or kill 10 percent of the workers, that the nest will collapse over the next few weeks. Is there any truth in this? I have no idea, Rupert. That's an interesting um, statement. I mean, I just from my own off the top of my head, I would probably say no, it wouldn't collapse because uh, 10 percent is quite a small proportion. But if, say, for example, I can't see any truth in that. I don't know. Um, interesting question. Maybe everybody here will be Googling a bit of it now, but I have not seen any evidence in that or truth in that. Um, but maybe I just haven't come across it. But yeah, interesting uh, question. Um, so, Anne, how can you dig them out when they are in stone walls? Well, yeah, you might struggle with that, Anne. Yeah. Um, you're, you're allergic. You're allergic. Um, you carry an EpiPen, but really these other products cause much more harm to the pest controller. She spoke to your supplier, but didn't really get a great alternative to bendiacarb as getting too close is not an option. Um, yeah, absolutely. And that, that's formed around your own risk assessment, isn't it? And it's, um, yeah, if, if uh, you know, your, your reactions are particularly severe. Um, I mean, I do know of uh, technicians or employers that have taken some technicians off of wasp control completely. 
they, they won't allow them to do it because their reaction is so severe. Now, if you're a sole trader or, or otherwise where you don't have that support, then maybe you feel it's not an option. But, you know, if you're, you know, your reaction is that severe and you're struggling to find something else that you can use that's going to keep you safe, then maybe, um, you know, uh, subcontracting it or not doing that work. I mean, it's not the most useful suggestion, but um, yeah, I think it's important you think about that. Um, Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions. We've got another 10 minutes. So uh, from Paul Hanasley, would you need to fill in a risk assessment for a box standard wasp nest treatment, say up above a second floor window, treating from outside, telescopic gear, where there are going to be in a wall cavity? Um, is it necessary to do a risk assessment each time for wasps, for legal terms, et cetera? So um, depending on the size of your company, if you're five or over employees, then you legally do have to record risk assessments. Now, what I would recommend for wasp treatments is that if you have a, a large company, five or over, you fill out a generic risk assessment for wasp control. Um, again, we've got templates for that. I can discuss it a bit more um, if you contact me directly because we've only got a bit of time left. But So a generic risk assessment that is covers all wasp treatments, be it in an office or domestic, it's a generic thing. Um, and then when you're on site, my recommendation is is that you do your risk assessment dynamically, so within your mind, and anything that you note as a risk and you've decided to do something to mitigate that risk, write it on your report. Um, that would be the best way. So a lot of the time, dynamic risk assessments are fine, as long as you've got some form of generic one to support it if you're over five employees. I recommend it regardless the size of your company. Um, but yeah, so that, that's the legal standing. Uh, so Ian, would it be worth carrying extra antihistamines to give to customers just in case as I need them having just been sung? I, I wouldn't recommend that, Ian. Um, I don't know why. It just doesn't sit well with me, us giving, you know, drugs, if you like, uh, to customers. You know, we don't know their situation. They might have a condition that, you know, antihistamines uh, are not appropriate for them. Uh, and yes, you would think they would volunteer this information. But I just think, advise them and say you know this is what can happen this is what you should do if you get stung um i can recommend if if you have antihistamines and you're allowed to take them that you purchase some or but don't i wouldn't give antihistamines to your customers uh so uh i use what three words it's brilliant for finding clients too there we go mike thank you a bit of feedback there um i have also experienced on a nest being rebuilt with no queens or larvae after removal. I removed the new nest, sprayed the air with peppermint oil and put in a decoy nest, but did not return. Great. OK, so, yeah, you're experiencing it there. Maybe it's a bit of confusion. Maybe the um, the wasps don't realise the queen has gone um, and they decide to rebuild it. So, yeah, great, great, great feedback there and some um, interesting scenarios. Pest control never seems to surprise me, really. Um, OK, many thanks. Great experience exchange and refresh on procedures. Yep, great, Martin. It is. It's it's just um, that's what it's about. Refreshing. It's not about, you know, teaching the ins and outs of the entomology of an insect or a wasp. It's about talking about the practicality of getting out there and, and doing these things. So, yeah, absolutely right, Martin. Um, are there other bendiacarb dust available which don't have new restrictions or any other restrictions apply? Not that I know of, Jamie. Um, again, keep an eye out. Um, you know, go talk to your suppliers and um, yeah, find out what products they've got. Speak to your suppliers. They're, they're a really great resource. You know, it's great for you to come to us and we love talking to you about what you're using and what you're doing. But um, yeah, talk to your suppliers. They, they, they have all of this information. They, um, you know, they'll, they'll promote all of their products. Uh, OK, so. Um, we've got another, we've got time for a few more questions. If I treat a nest and or remove one in the day outside, I leave a wasp bag to help catch any foraging wasps that return. Great. So you're all doing this training for me. It's great. I'm just going to read out your um, statements and questions and uh, it's helping me. But yeah, if you treat a nest and you remove it and you've got some foraging ones hanging around, yeah, stick a, a wasp bag up with the appropriate attractant in it. And um, yeah, we're all sorted and we're, we're keeping those, those wasps at bay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, can you suggest a good pesticide or insecticide to rid of wasps inside control boxes that are installed outdoors for satellite communications field? I would love to, Nelson, but um, as I said, we don't, we can't, 
I mean, you know, you've got pyrethroids, uh, you know, trade name wise, I, I really don't want to use this platform to talk about different trade names. Um, I'm sure there will be something. Because if you external areas, um, unless your customer says that you can't use something specific in an area because of technical issues, be it with the wires or the control box, then uh, again, ask them these questions. Say, look, this is what I want to use. Is there a problem in terms of what you've got going on here? And as long as there's not and your label says you're allowed to use it there, you can use it there. Um, again, we can discuss more. So uh, we've got one there. Two more questions. I think we've got time. Uh, Rupert, hi, sorry, you cannot give, uh, yeah, sorry, you cannot give any medicine to third parties, not even aspirin yet, like I said before. Uh, be against the law and leave you open to legal action. Uh, EpiPens cannot be applied by a third party either unless it is a doctor. Um, so, yeah, as Rupert says, he agrees, you know, don't be given any drugs or, you know, antihistamines or anything else to, to third parties. Um, so, Simon, again, be careful recommending antihistamines as I am allergic to them. So this comes back to, yeah, again, not giving it to your customers and also with your technicians. This is how your health questionnaires um, form part of your risk assessing, you know, to ask these questions and say, right, what can you have? What can't you have? Um, you know, ask them, find out yourself what is and what isn't. Um, appropriate for the person. But yeah, it said, Simon, you're allergic to them. It is very rare and was only discovered when it was given to me by a doctor. Um, never give anything to anyone assuming it's okay. Absolutely. Not a true word, Simon. Okay, I've got time for one more question. I've got a few outstanding, but I promise I will. Um, so there'll be a question from, uh, so yeah, I've got Simon. Oh, we've had him, Alberto. We're going to have a look into that. Actually, I think I might have done them all. So, Chris, last one. If you are in the position to remove the nest and not use chemicals, how do you then dispose of the wasp nest? Oh, yeah, good, good, good question. So if you use if you do use a pesticide in there, ultimately, you know, be it on site or off site, because, you know, those wasps are alive in there, um, then that's going to be hazardous waste. So you'll need to dispose of it as hazardous waste. If the wasps succumb in a non-toxic way, so natural causes or you use something um, of more natural origin that's not hazardous, then it would be non-hazardous waste. Um, I would say putting it through your normal company waste management process. So if you, the same way you'd get rid of, I don't know, non uncontaminated PPE or your um, boxes that you might have that, that are non-hazardous, you know, your non-hazardous route of control. But your, your waste contractor will tell you also. So if you use some suppliers do uh, waste control, they'll be able to say to you what they can do with it. But yeah, do your proper waste management uh, uh, controls. Don't stick it in your bin at home. Don't do that. Uh, okay, that's all the time I have got for now. So uh, if there's a couple of questions that might come through that are coming through, I will uh, get back to you uh, specifically. Thank you very much.